once upon a time there was a big gay bitch and they went to sleep at the end cooking me's one of your enemies wait why she ruined your guaranteed so what you're saying is you wished on Kokomi's banner and you were upset when you got Kokomi. <laughs> I'd say ask your parents. Yeah, fair enough. I'm not down to do a seance right now. You rock up to the VC and people are on cam doing origami. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that was weird. Hey, are you guys already finished with everything in the Metropole? Mm, no need to prioritize me. Uh, there's just this place I really want to go check out. Feel free to get back to me once you've got everything sorted out. We're all good. Great, then let's go! I've delivered packages all over, but I've never seen a mysterious fairy tale world like this before. Looks like nobody has gotten around to repairing this house yet. Ugh, even I wouldn't dare to sleep in there. Ta it might suddenly collapse in on you. Oh. Nothing to see here either. Maybe we can find someone to ask? <gasps> you and Elu, let's fucking go! Uh -huh. Aha! <laughs> Over there! I bet we'll find some people there. Let's go take a look! Where? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh huh? I was sure there'd be people here. There once was a goddess who ruled over fate. Before she died, she left three riddles for the kingdom she had created. What? Who said that? Long story short, on this day, a sentient feline, an outlander, and a uh, diminutive pixie arrived on the scene. They saw a narrow path off to the side. Okay, but which side? It is? Oh, yeah. nice. If you I was like, this is a really good action. like that to a Comania Express courier, they give you the parcel right back and tell you to write the delivery address more clearly. <laughs> Despite how obvious the answer was, the perplexed pixie and the flummoxed feline struggled to work it out. Hmm. Although, perhaps a small part of the blame could be attributed to my dull narration. All right, let's uh, try this again. <clears throat> the path on the left-hand side seemed to give off an enticing it's fragrance, nice as if to say, uh, this is the way to wealth and glory. That sounds like the start of a good story. Then what? Then what? <laughs> I really the like his path, voice. The motley crew would soon spot a secret stone room. A prophecy had once foretold of a marquee who shall one day venture inside. And thus it is named the future marquee's abode to be. You like it? The future marquee's abode to be? Got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? That was a little bit boastful. But before you continue, I must warn you of the danger that lies ahead. For example, under no circumstances should you sit on the chair in the center. <laughs> Otherwise, the consequences could be a bit embarrassing. <laughs> <clears throat> so many summers, winters, springs, and falls. And now, at last, a hero hither strides. This realm knows not what lies beyond its walls. Its secrets mystify the world outside. Wait, new voices? Who are they? This is a chair that you definitely shouldn't sit on. I think it is here. With wood and earthenware strewn all around, the demon feline's fury <laughs> can't be quelled. Reducing them <laughs> to rubble on the ground, she finds the vessels vacant save for... Uh... Air? She <laughs> finds long gone the chins that once they held. Are they describing how we broke the boxes and jars? Who are you calling Demon Feline? <laughs> Not them calling me the fuck out. <laughs> Witness Pact. In the name of the elders of our three tribes, we hereby form this pact. That from this day forth, our people shall harm one another no more. No more shall we drip glue into each other's breakfasts, nor strike each other's heads with pickaxes, nor secretly drink growth serum that does not belong to us. We acknowledge the truth that has been determined by the great clockwork key, and we shall see the family of truth as supreme. Three witnesses to history within the future Marquis abode to be, quietly awaiting the Marquis of Carabas, who is foretold will pluck up the great clockwork key. 
Let this esteemed one guide us, revealing one truth and two fictions. Of course, if the highest house has not been selected, then we may yet contend in private, within permissible limits. But no more glue. It does far too much harm, and is utterly inhumane. <laughs> That's funny. Captivated by the epic poetry, and enthralled by the outstanding storytelling, the Outlanders knew what their next of with wood and earthenware soon oh. all around. The demon feline's well. fury can't be quelled, reducing them to rubble on the ground. No, no you don't. I wrote that line. Don't start plagiarizing me just because you can't take a bit of criticism. Uh, look, let's not put form over content here. It's not about the rhymes. It's about making sure the outlanders focus on the clockwork key on that platform. <laughs> uh, perhaps the outlanders are worried that something drastic will happen the moment they remove it. Maybe that's why they're investigating the area thoroughly first. <laughs> can't fault them for that. I'm wondering if we can take it... Oh? As the outlander stands before the clockwork key, they're overcome by a sudden urge to set it free! Also, Cafe, that'll be my last rhyming line. I'm not writing any more poetry until you apologize. <laughs> uh, what does it matter, anyway? I've lost count of how many people have tried this before. No one's getting that key out. Namely, to remove the clockwork key from the raised platform up ahead. Cabe, I just realized you said we all had to speak like bards, but every time you open up your mouth, I don't hear any rhymes. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that too. It's one standard for us and another for you. <laughs> That's not fair, Cabe. <laughs> this is bizarre but funny. Stop the poem. We have a situation. <laughs> Something's up with this person. <laughs> Traveler? Uh, are you all right? This reminds me of um, the Golden Slumber. Turns out there's glue. You try to stand up, but the glue is holding you firmly in place. Come on, you can do it. This can't be how our story ends. Try to stand. Oh, my mouse. Try to stand up. You manage to partially unstick yourself. The issue isn't that you can't break free. It's more that you don't want to tear your clothes in the process. They mean a lot to you. Can I give you them. a hand or a tail, even? You're trying to stand up. You finally free yourself and stand up, clothes intact. <laughs> what the fuck? Strong as stone, firm as steel. The outlander pulls, but it does not yield. This has happened many times before, but this time is different. A thought enters the Outlander's mind. Attack! Attack! First to weaken the structure, then seize the treasure! Oh. The attack now over! Only one final step remains! Now it is the time to seize the key! Yes! Finally! Come on, move your butts! And your lights, assuming they're still in working order. It's showtime! <laughs> no hard feelings about your lack of poetic contributions? <laughs> oh, let it go! Ah! Welcome, esteemed and noble outlander. Allow us to introduce ourselves. We represent the three great clans of this realm, having been selected as its authorized historical supervisors. Our purpose being to await the arrival of one such as yourselves who shall remove the clockwork key. My name is... You're Cape, he's Albizzi, and that's Bulbarano, right? You've done so much talking that we can already tell you apart by your voices. <laughs> Aren't Damn. we missing someone, though? The guy who led us here to begin with? Who? <clears throat> and thus was born <laughs> the long-awaited fellowship, destined to uncover the truth of the past. Allow me to quote, if I may, in the history of Constellation Metropole, a new page has begun. Him. Love that voice. Well, there's no fourth person, so which of you is the ventriloquist? Come on, out with it. We've never heard that voice before, but he sounds like he'd be good at reading bedtime stories to children. Well, whoever it is, I don't know and I don't care. Forget about him. We have far more important things to focus on. Like, where our journey goes from here. 
That key you hold is the pivot point about which the past and present of the Metropole revolve. However, between our three clans, there is some dispute over the historical record. Each clan has its own version of history, detailing the clan's origins and the tale of the dragon of old. And unfortunately, we don't know which one is the truth. Dragon? You mean the one that's been acting up recently? Oh, no, 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 not that one, you adorable little pixie. When I say dragon of old... <laughs> he means a dragon that would be really, really old if it was still with us today, but it was defeated in ancient times. The new one has nothing to do with our clan history. Uh, was that supposed to be a joke? Uh, anyway, <laughs> so you've been waiting for someone to remove the key so you can finally explore the truth of the past? Not just explore it, but argue incessantly about it. <laughs> Honestly, I don't care that much. Cape's the one who's always bothering us about it. What we need to figure out is who resolved the dragon crisis. We have to know that before we can decide which is the supreme clan. Let me guess. The three the clans worked you together. The key from where it was lodged, you became the honorary marquis. We humbly beseech you, noble outlander. Call me Holly. Noble traveler marquis, we ask you to help us. You and your... Uh, your talking puss in boots and the pale floating pixie. Puss in boots? Are you serious? It's better than demon feline, but still... <laughs> Embrace it, my friend. Embrace it. Most cats don't wear boots or speak, do they? I'm not even a cat. I'm a Nekomata. Now that you know the word, I expect you to use it. <laughs> Please Damn. allow me to lead you all to a sacred memorial site. It will be much easier to explain what needs to be done once we are there. Cape leads the party to the so-called sacred memorial site. This place is sacred to my clan. It's where our brave forefathers once took up arms against the dragon of old. After a bitter battle that dragged on for many <laughs> days and nights, finally, our forefathers fought the dragon into submission, and it fled. They took turns, though. Some forefathers worked the day shift, while others worked the night shift. <laughs> what? They took shifts from fighting the dragon. So they worked shifts while the poor dragon had to work around the clock. So they say. It's just a legend, though. Wait a second. Did I just hear you admit that your clan's history is just a legend? A history, legend, who cares? My clan was definitely courageous. That's the point. That's the truth. And isn't the truth what we've all been arguing about nonstop for all these years? Cape's words gave the traveler food for thought. Could it be that the truth in a fictional world is equivalent to fiction in the real world? Mm. But that would have to wait. Apparently, Cape was not alone in his pilgrimage to this sacred site. Dusky. Unwanted company had arrived. The traveler and the talking cat, <clears throat> Nekomata, decided to teach them some manners. Wow. A true display of heroism and valor. It was as if the spirits of my ancestors were... <laughs> Your martial oh. prowess and show of courage are a more vivid reenactment of my ancestors' feats that suit the modern aesthetic. Now, let's get down to business. As we all know, time is but an illusion. Time may flow line by line, page by page, or frame by frame, but usually it flows in the form of springs and gears. And that clockwork key you have in your hand can turn back time and make the past reappear. Well, actually, my view is that the illusion of time is more of a problem of consciousness. <laughs> gears power the body while the body is the vessel of the conscious mind. But the mind cannot understand the dimension of time, so we experience instead an endless continuum of moments as the pinion of now turns along the rack of ages. What is this fucking I, philosophical I'm debate? I'm getting flashbacks to when I was delivering <laughs> packages to the Sumeru Academia. A teacher once asked Albizzi what his greatest fear was, and he replied, dragons. Boberano was asked the same question. He replied, time, and repeated the argument we just heard. 
The teacher then turned to Cape and posed the same question. He replied, Boberano. <laughs> the manuscript that tells the truth of the historical record, the blueprint to all of creation, the work of the great mage themselves, it can be found at the beginning of the Girak and on the very first page of the book. Uh, Paimon didn't follow all that, but basically, you're just saying that we need to put the key in and turn it all the way back? Exactly. It is said that in the beginning, the goddess of creation took the goddess of fate's manuscript as a blueprint, placed it under the goddess of prophecy's starry realm, and generated the world from a few magic arrays. So in a few moments, when the great clockwork key turns the local time here back to the very beginning, we will restore the magic arrays back to their original configurations. Hold on, isn't stealing part of the blueprint of creation a little dangerous? Also, how are we supposed to know the original configurations of the magic arrays? Uh, uh, well, the general shapes of the configurations have been passed down over the ages. They now form the family crests of each of our clans. So you'll just need to reference my family crest and join the dots accordingly. To address your other concern, when the house has already been built, do you really think that taking away the construction crew and blueprint will cause it to collapse? Sure. The Traveler Marquis prepares to insert the Great Clockwork Key into the nearby keyhole. Once using the key, now why don't I use the same methods? Maybe we'll give it a good old whack or two. Uh. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. Um Right, so we start I guess we should start here. Yeah, I'm looking. Behold, the sacred writings that record the truth of... No, wait. That have shaped the truth of history. Gather round and let us bear witness. Oh, okay. Goddess's Manuscript 1. Brave Francois mounted the haystack, picked up a fork, and planted it tines down atop the mountain of grass. Behind him was a large, bright moon. He shouted out the names of everyone in the village. The village chief was first to be named, and so frightened was he that he wished to climb up the haystack and st stop up Francois's mouth. Are you crazy? You're yelling so loudly the dragon might show up. You good for nothing. Have you not seen how the windmill everyone built has been destroyed by the dragon? And here you are, worrying if it will return? Francois really would have loved to kick him off the haystack, but held back, given that the chief, too, was worried for the villagers' safety. Francois saw that nigh all the villagers had arrived, and so he cleared his throat. Dear neighbours and kin, think you still that we must endure this? No, of course not, but we cannot do anything about the dragon, said the grocer. Who says so? Did I not leap onto its neck from the windmill blades, stepping on it twice, and did it not fall down and flee? Perhaps everyone worked so hard to build the mill that was destroyed, everyone's emotions became inflamed. Lift, lift, hmm. Lifting up their fists, they decided to take on the dragon. But Francois lifted his own hands and calmed the crowd. Let us go home for today, everyone. Everyone's present lack of self-preservation is not bravery, but rather wrath. If we yet decide to face danger after calming ourselves, only then may we truthfully call our sentiment valor. So everyone went home. The next day, there were still many youngsters who wished to follow Francois to take on the wicked dragon. Who would have known that the Valiant possessed the protection of the goddess's radiant charter? Encountering true valor, the dragon could neither spout fire nor slash with claws, and was forced to allow the other party to call pauses and switch personnel. And so, after several days and nights of fierce fighting, the wicked dragon could no longer bear it, and chose to surrender. A.A. Feast your eyes, rejoice, and cheer, for this is the unquestionable truth. Look at the signature. Nobody is capable of forging that. 
Right. I don't Kuta believe a. it. So, all along, our histories have been false? Don't lose heart, Albizzi. It does not follow from his is true that ours are false. True. That might be the most bogus logic I've ever heard. But keep up the mental gymnastics, Boberano. I've been waiting for that look of jealousy on your face my whole life, and I'm going to savor it. <laughs> and yet, it seemed that this conundrum could indeed have more than one solution. Everyone agreed that there may be more than one truth. The party decided to visit the sacred sites of the other clans and see what their documents had to say. Isn't a narrator supposed to remain detached and objective? It feels like you're forcing a narrative agenda <laughs> on us here. Well, whatever. I'm in a good mood. Let's do it. The instructions say to repeat the process three times, and besides, I'm looking forward to watching you both be sorely disappointed. Let's do my clan next. I'll lead the way. Capet's voice we'll actor the key again, seems right? familiar. Let me see if I can pull it out. Yoink! <laughs> Capet's voice actor seems familiar, but I don't know... I don't know who. Hmm, the party finds no pedestal in which to place the great clockwork key. Only a locked door. Where's your clan's pedestal? Oh, let me guess, you hid it away in advance to save yourself the embarrassment yeah. of having it exposed as a fake? You done? Okay. Now, since my clan's main claim to fame is... <laughs> Misinformation, half-truths, and fabrication. Oh, shit. Ah, shut up, Cape. Shut, shut up, Cape. <laughs> I swear, if I wind up dead one day, the murderer was Boberano. Let those be my last words. <laughs> <clears throat> My clan's claim to fame is that we outwitted the dragon of old and stole its treasure. Ergo, all articles of value that we own, including the pedestal for the clockwork key, lie behind that door. So, next step is open the door? Almost. There's one step before that. The door is protected by a smart interrogation system. We have to answer its questions, and if we get them wrong, we will alert law enforcement. <laughs> Jeez! Well, do you at least know the answers? The correction fluid of time has dyed white the pages of the Book of Wisdom. <laughs> uh, no. No, I don't know the answers. <laughs> but worry not! That's incredible. I had a quick word with the constabulary in advance. They'll ignore the alarm if we get the questions wrong, so answer without fear. There's no response from the door and nothing unusual about it. Knock on the door. Question one. Who is it? Um. Harley Maiki and her retinue. The great yokai, Nekomada in boots. And the trusty travel guide, Pixie. A uh, travel guide. Trusty travel guide. <laughs> Question two. By which virtue did the ancients defeat the dragon? Um, wisdom. If this is the right answer, I swear I'll... Correct! What? Ugh, a barefaced lie. So low. Question three. Which is more real? The fiction of the outside world? Or the truth of this world? Um... Both are equally real. Hear, hear! Who can be sure that the outside world isn't just a dream? And that when the dreamer wakes up, they won't just find themselves inside a novel? There is no way to know, therefore Dem both are equally real. All correct. You may have the key pedestal. The door opens and a puff of smoke wafts out. After the smoke clears, Traveler the pedestal Marquee, appears. You know what must be done. Please insert the great clockwork key. On it, boss. Oh, and uh, this is my family crest. Oh, great shot. Um, I guess it will tell me. Yeah. Oh yeah. So this is where we start. Hmm. hmm. Do we really need this one? Yeah. Ice. Ice. Now, 
let me see what what elaborate fiction the clan of wisdom was able to conjure up. If anyone's listening, I would like to submit these as my last words. I surrender. I'm the one who murdered Cappy. <laughs> Holy shit. Goddess's manuscript too. Lies Antonio in the basement of the crumbling house began reading the ancient book he had found. His oil lamp shook from time to time as the swaying structure above ground collapsed. The village was to be symbolically raised by the dragon, and he had been chosen by the dragon, for he had not returned home, but Antonio did not care. He only wished to study the book the old lady had given him on the bridge he passed today. This book was titled The Radiant Charter, and within was recorded all the rules that every being in Simulanka must follow. It was written in the language of world's creation at the very start, and if Antonio was not possessed of extraordinary wisdom and deciphered this primordial text, there would have been no study to be had. This book recorded no solutions as to resolving the difficulty that Constellation Satellite presently faced, nor did it contain any hexes that could aid Antonio in repairing his own home. But he knew that wisdom was the mightiest thing in the world. The morning light shone through the ruins of his home, and the neighbouring blacksmith and chubby chief took great pains to get rid of the house's wreckage, which blocked the basement hatch. With dark circles about his eyes, Antonio said to the chubby chief, I shall defeat the dragon. I will return soon. Are you sure you're alright? You don't look like you got any sleep. Just smoke from the oil lamp. Don't worry about it. The dragon sat atop a mountain of treasures, gazing down at insignificant little Antonio walking closer. Flames gathered in its throat, preparing to burn the area one centimetre before him, all the better to scare this puny, foolish creature away. Halt! I'm a qualified second-class meister. The Radiant Charter states that should I refuse a duel, you cannot use force. This restriction did indeed exist, and so the wicked dragon swallowed its flames whole. Ah, how it dreaded going to the toilet tomorrow. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> Antonio, for his part, had not expected that the second class rust clearing meister qualification exam he had taken on a lark would come in useful. And since I am a second class meister, I propose a duel of riddles. You cannot refuse. Face me. <laughs> now Simulanka had just such a law, mainly for the benefit of sphinxes, old sages and princesses who wished to make life hard for others. <laughs> The evil dragon had not expected this rule to catch up with it. I shall ask the first question. My house sold for 8,000 lorry yesterday, but I thought there was room to raise the price, so I bought it back for 9,000, planning to sell it for 10,000. How much more did I lose in the end? The dragon laughed in contempt. What's so hard about that? You could have waited until it hit 10,000 to make your move, but you sold for 8 and bought for 9, so you lost 1,000 more that you could have earned instead. Wrong. You burned my house down yesterday, and I couldn't sell it in time, so I've lost far more. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I do have to burn a house, and you happen to not be home, so I might as well hit one that doesn't result in any loss of life. Now that you've lost this contest, I have the right to loot of the same value as your life, minus one mora. And considering that you've burned my house, I can seek damages. Let's assume that my house is worth just one mora. Well then, wicked dragon, you know what to do with yourself. Please spare me, I'll give you anything. Your words, not mine, Antonio said as he pulled out a contract he had written long ago. Thus did Antonio use his wisdom to take all the evil dragon's treasures. The dragon, devastated, would never again return to attack Constellation Satellite, where Antonio lived. Many years later, a child asked Antonio, You sold your place for 8,000 and spent 9,000 buying it back, so it looks like you actually did lose 1,000 Mora? <laughs> AA. <sighs> <laughs> look, look, my clan's history is true as well. Ah, there's that same unforgeable signature again, right here. What? Oh, does this mean that my clan is the only odd one out? Given that my clan's wisdom is such a subject of ridicule in your eyes, I will now appeal to my own personal intelligence, which I believe far surpasses that of my clan at large, <laughs> and make a prediction. It seems likely that the claims made by each of our clans regarding their history and virtue are all true. Boberano? How can that be? Oh, I get what's going on.
going on? <laughs> me too. Once, when I was drinking with Guji Yai, she bet me a round of dried fish that I couldn't guess which cup the umeboshi was under. Whichever one I guessed, I was always wrong, and Guji Yai would lift a different cup to reveal the umeboshi. But then, I learned later from one of the shrine maidens, Miyuki, that all of the cups had an umeboshi under them. <sighs> Just goes to show, I still got a long way to go before I become Isn't a great yokai. Isn't that you sister? Oh, don't mind, Fox Lady. That's just her way of teasing you. <laughs> Actually, that reminds me. We can now open these three treasure chests. And unlike the guessing game you mentioned, this one's not a trick. Cool. Well, once you've plundered the last of Oberano's family wealth, we can go to my clan's place. <laughs> Guess I'll take the clockwork key again, then. Yoink! <laughs> the cohort of truth seekers followed Albizzi to his clan's sacred site. They arrived to the site of a giant guard towering over them. Up ahead is my clan's gigantified guard. He can be a little pig-headed, and he's incredibly strong. Your weapons won't even scratch him. Wait, but wasn't Cape's clan the one that's all about strength? So, what do you guys believe in then? Oh, the guard is one of Cape's people. Size is a coveted trait in the clan of strength, after all. Mine is the clan of empathy, and our key contribution is growth serum. What's empathetic about that? Interesting. Our ancestors believed that, just maybe, the dragon of old didn't mean us any harm at all. Perhaps <laughs> the dragon simply didn't notice us, since we are so very tiny. Me. So, they drank the growth serum <laughs> tiny and money. grew even larger than the dragon. Then, they set the dragon down, <laughs> calmly explained their perspective, <laughs> and eventually taught it how to empathize. You know what? Maybe uh, yours is the wrong that's, one that's wrong. <laughs> the serum isn't what it once was, though. Nowadays, it doesn't make you grow all that much, and it actually makes you lose your empathy. So, I advise we take a detour. <laughs> Despite <laughs> Albizzi's words of caution, somebody, no doubt, has other ideas. Surely we could avoid a conflict with the guard, they think to themselves. If we could just try to understand one another. You could, of course, just take the path to your left and go around. But some people are gluttons for punishment. It's all part of the experience, I suppose. Oh, you know what we're doing. Hi. Everyone, I have returned. I come with the long-awaited Marquis and their followers to search for the lost origins of our clan. Well, we weren't told anything about that this morning. Get out of here. Leave us alone. The dry guards scoop you all up and throw you outside. No one is able to fight back. Damn. <sighs> you and Albizzi only wanted to strike up a conversation with the guard. But since greeting you wasn't one of the items included in today's schedule, the relationship quickly soured. If you're just looking for a way in, why not consider taking the path on your left? <laughs> why is um, my own clan treating me like a villain? You've been away too long. We all have. It feels like we've been waiting forever. Mm. Yeah. Hee <laughs> hee. Over here! I found it! I like destruction. <laughs> No, they spawned them back. getting close. <laughs> Why is this place so full of junk? Are you the kind of people who never throw away the box when you buy something because you're worried <laughs> you won't be able to return it without the original packaging? Uh, we'll never find the Oracle Pillars in all this mess. Never mind that. We have a more pressing issue. It seems there's a slight problem with my clan's family crest. The Marquis may need to utilize their wisdom to solve the issue. Oh, okay. Wisdom, too, huh? Well, you guys have a bit of everything, don't you? Except empathy. <laughs> Dried. Over here! Yes! Keep the noise down! Oh. We don't want to alert the guard. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Keep watch. Oh, I have to destroy this to there we go. Um, alright, so so that would be 
Apparently that was incorrect. But oh. don't blame yourself. It's Albizzi's clan's fault for taking terrible care of their family crest. How can they let something so important get so dirty? Maybe... Oh, yeah, okay. This was throwing me off. <laughs> this is the last one. Goddesses Manuscript 3. Galileo and Alberto did many good deeds again today, though it was most tiring to help the old lady on the bridge move her barrels of hard apple cider. They each got a small barrel as their reward. The moonlight was unobstructed and beautiful, and the two good friends climbed up the high wall that had been built to save the evil dragon off. Alberto lost the rock-paper-scissors match, so he had to hold the barrel of cider under the crook of his arm as they climbed the ladder. Look, this is the big house that our chubby chief was so proud of. Doesn't look so big from here, huh? said Alberto as he looked at the house. You're wrong, that's my home, said Galileo. The chief's house is that one. Alberto's night vision was not all that good, and moonlight could never compare to daylight. If one were to close one's eyes, the light could not be seen at all. He tried a little harder, but could discern nothing more. But it's also really small, Galileo continued, so there's nothing wrong with your statement. Galileo and Alberto were both rather perceptive people. Galileo's reply covered for Alberto's discomfort, <laughs> discomfort regarding his poor vision, while Alberto also lost the rock-paper-scissors match on purpose, so that he could carry the cider barrel, because the gears under Galileo's ribs were injured. Here's to you. The two friends raised a toast once Alberto stuffed a cork back into the barrel. The next day, the two gathered everyone in the village plaza. First, they apologised for the collapse of the anti-dragon wall and told all the people that they were preparing to have a talk with the evil dragon. I know it was a lot of work for everyone to fix that wall, but we're not that fussed about it anyway, the chubby chief said. But are you sure you're not bragging when you say you knocked it down yourselves? Of course, that was not the chief's point. He too was a good person. He continued. Also, it's too dangerous to seek the dragon out. Don't worry about us. And so the two best friends in the whole world departed. The evil dragon trembled before Alberto and Galileo. For some reason, the old lady's liquor could make people grow very, very large. That was how they accidentally squashed the high walls the previous night. As they gazed down at the ground far below, they more or less understood how the dragon thought. No wonder it could accidentally destroy the village at its feet. So, as long as they could get the dragon to notice people, they could surely come to an understanding. The two friends thus drank all the remaining magic cider, becoming even larger than the dragon by a good margin. Reeking of alcohol, they sandwiched the dragon between them, and drunkenly tried reasoning with it. The dragon shriveled up in terror. All of its majesty and fell aura forever gone, indeed. It even looked kind of pitiful. Alberto attempted to pick dirt off the scales on the dragon's back, but wound up picking off an entire scale. The dragon sought to flee, but Galileo, fearing that the crisis might persist for 10,000 years more if the misunderstanding was not cleared up, tugged its tail and dragged it right back. To be honest, we've always lived under your feet, but we are far too small, so you may not have ever seen us. Now we've transformed and become big, Galileo said. So now, surely, you must know that we dwell at your feet. The dragon nodded repeatedly. And thus did the two and the dragon chat all night, and believing the goal of mutual understanding achieved, the two set off along the road home. Hey, hey. The signature. So it's true. Empathy is one of the founding virtues of Constellation Metropole, too. Just as we suspected, all three are the true. I reckon there were three different dragons. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, this is a lot to process. <laughs> I, I feel a little empty inside. <laughs> yes, we found the truth, but there's too much truth. I get you. It's like in Inazuma, when there were only six books in the Mirage Warrior series, it was really popular. But by the time book number 88 came <laughs> out, nobody wanted to read it. They all lost interest. A brief moment of joy is drowned out by a growing feeling of melancholy. But perhaps there is a glimmer of hope to be found too? Anyone? Anyone? All right, I'll say it. How is it the case that these three versions of history can all be true at once? That's exactly what Pano was wondering, but Boboron kind 
of already explained it away earlier. So, Paimon was worried she'd look stupid for asking <laughs> the question. Aww. It's not a stupid question at all, my dear little pixie. While I did postulate that different truths may coexist, there is an issue when it comes to these three truths in particular. The problem is, all three truths are the history of the exact same thing, namely the dragon and the Metropole's origins. Yet all three bear the signature, showing that they're genuine. Suddenly, the sound of a bell rings out. First series had the six bell. books since like a billion years. Right uh. What does that mean again? Ah, <laughs> yes! Highest level of emergency! Everyone to the main entrance! Stat! Bring all the glue traps and place them outside the gates! The whole city is on the lookout, and there's only one way out. It's the path right in front of you. What happens if I go over here? Oh, okay. Suspicious individuals detected. I don't know what law you've broken, but we're currently at the highest level of alert. Come with us. Turn yourselves in. Everyone scatters. You hear Capay's voice shouting out, It's every bird for himself! After the guards have gone, you regroup back at the same place. Looks like no one was caught. Let's try that again, shall we? It's the path right in front of you. Why'd they ring the bell anyway? Also, why is one ring the highest level of emergency? Obviously because you have to <laughs> respond fast when it's an emergency. It'd be a bit too late if they waited till the 99th ring. <laughs> hmm. I wondered if, if anything would happen if I went through these, but you really just go slightly slower. Key, but I yoinked it out before we ran, just in case. <laughs> okay, nice. but back to the truth problem. There are three conflicting versions of the truth, and somehow they're all still true. What is that supposed to mean? I don't know. I doubt anyone here in Simulanka can make sense of it. All we do know is that any manuscript bearing her signature has to be valid. Well, she is the goddess of fate, the creator of all this, and all these manuscripts are her grand design. The reason we argued about who was right was that we didn't know enough about the truth of the past. But now we have the truth. So we just have to accept it. As surely as we will follow the clockwork path designed for us, so is this the course that history has taken. It is clear and incontrovertible. We will never argue again. Ah, <sighs> thank you all. Is that all there is to it? Is this where the decision made at the first <laughs> crossroads of destiny has led us to? A pointlessly happy ending. <laughs> huh. Overthinking it would be equally pointless. Well, that's enough for one day. Time to take a break. Could you be any more cryptic? You're planning something. Paimon knows it. Whatever happens, today was a breakthrough in my journey of discovery. I will go back and share it with my clan. Me too. And me. Let's leave it there for today, then. I'm sure we'll find out what else Mr. Narrator has planned for us tomorrow. Something you... What a beautiful day, thought the Traveler, before she was overcome by a creeping sense of foreboding. <laughs> the voice in her head grew louder. Must go to Pendulum Lane. Hi. Captain, do you need help with anything? Why do you ask? Because Her Majesty the King, the revered boss herself, has personally advised me to help the people around me. And, well, you're around me. <laughs> you're right here. Right there. Hmm. Sorry, that was just me trying to liven things up a little. <clears throat> anyway, I think we should head out and see if the residents of the city need our assistance. Good idea. I will lead the way. Pendulum Lane is just up ahead. Something must have happened here after all. Everyone's crowded around. Oh, my God. This is terrible. I don't understand. 
the three great clans of Constellation Metropole have finally made peace with each other. Who could have done this? What happened? Oh no, someone's lying on the ground. Cape! How did this happen? Cape, you idiot! Wake up! You need to revise your last words or everyone's gonna start suspecting me! <laughs> last words? What did he say? Ahem. <laughs> if I wind up dead one day, the murderer was Boberano. <laughs> you could have at least pretended to not remember it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Boberano, but this is an interrogation. I have to give the detectives straight answers. Ah, don't worry, Boberano. I don't consider you a suspect, nor do I have the authority to charge anyone with a crime. So are you the last people to have had contact with him? Y yes My sincere condolences. You were travel companions, right? It's a real tragedy. I'm afraid he'll be out cold for another hour and a half, at least. Huh? Yeah, I know. It's despicable. Hitting someone in the back of the head is the second worst act of cruelty there is. The first being replacing their gear oil with extra strong glue. So... Cape's... not dead? Uh, his gears, metal frame and shell are all still in excellent condition. It's just his uh, energy supply that's been all messed up. Ah, uh, wait. But surely you can't be suggesting that just because Cape isn't broken, there's no need to go looking for the culprit. No, no! There's a need! Huge need! Unfortunately, this is rapidly turning into a cold case. There's no evidence, and no witnesses. <laughs> he just got on the scene. Uh, unless there's an official clockwork pedestal, the goddess of prophecy around here somewhere. By that logic, every case <coughs> is a cold case. Uh, uh, excuse me. <laughs> then suddenly, the long-lost dragon of old flew across the sky. Where? Where? <laughs> uh, I didn't see anything. Wait. Why can't I move? Oh, my mistake. It was just a cloud. Or a bird. Or something. <laughs> if only we could turn time backwards and replay the crime. <laughs> uh... Isn't that one of those, uh, clockwork socket things right behind you? Ah, so it is. No wonder everyone here is suddenly struggling to move. Uh, Traveller, if you please, let's uh, recreate the crime scene. I needed to sit more gay. The crime scene's too chaotic. I can't make heads or tails of it. Well, that clears it up. Cape was walking along the street, and he suddenly collapsed. He was faking it. What? So case closed? Aren't you supposed to investigate a little more first? Well, we literally replayed the crime scene and saw it with our own eyes. There's no need for any evidence gathering or powers of deduction now. And besides, maybe the truth is inherently strange by nature. Like how Constellation Metropole has three histories, each of which is the truth. But didn't you say Cape was struck in the back of the head and knocked unconscious? For all I know, he could have bashed his head against the toilet bowl before leaving the house, then walked here in a daze before finally passing out. As for why he might have done that, my guess is... Is... With the Supreme Clan question left unanswered and the tension in Constellation Metropole okay. suddenly wiped away, he was looking to create a new source of conflict. No, no. Only then would the city feel alive again. Uh, do we really think he's capable of that, though? Sounds like a pretty complicated... 
complicated conspiracy for the average Simulanka resident. Traveler, something about the crime scene isn't sitting right with me. It just seems unnatural. Also, anything outside of the immediate area won't have appeared in the replay. Is it possible that something was missing from the scene? Why don't we search the area? Wait, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, we're... Uh, we're gonna head to Catbay's house to check the toilet bowl for signs of an impact. <laughs> I bet it was the detective. Uh, hello there. Uh, have you seen my spear by any chance? Someone was shouting about a dragon a minute ago, and I instinctively threw it into the sky. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you're, uh, you're not from these parts, are you? You're just <laughs> What's visiting? Just you? Yep, that's right. Why? What's up? Ah, well, I was going to offer you a great job in the Titanium Mines. A safe and secure working environment. Uh, doesn't sound very safe. Uh, at least not as safe as being a courier. To keep the Titanium ore intact, we use specially designed pickaxes that can't cut through it. Even if you struck a person with it, it wouldn't so much as leave a scratch. And in terms of labor intensity, the work has been rated as class the end for the mines. physical labor by a reputable organization. Even cats can do it. I think this is the the guy who was doing like all the British stuff. I think this is him doing an American accent. I think. I'm not. A... Ugh, never mind. I give up. Welcome to Paimon's world. <laughs> Mind you, I don't know what happened today, but somehow a pickaxe has gone missing. Cause it, Maybe it, one of the giant guards broke it down, so someone took it to perform a rapid resuscitation procedure. It definitely sounds like someone putting on an American accent. Sounds pretty brutal for a first aid technique. Still, a missing pickaxe. Huh. Is it just me, Traveler, or does it seem kind of suspicious? There's a spear here! It's <laughs> so mysterious. Let's take it! Oh. A pickaxe? Mm. What is it doing all the way down here? There's gotta be a story behind it. Let's take it. <sighs> come here. Whatever it is you were looking to buy, please do come back tomorrow. It's just, I have to close early today. A bottle of growth serum has gone missing. If someone's stolen it with the intention of harming others, the consequences could be disastrous. There's a whole investigation into it, so I gotta close the shop while I do an inventory count. If it turns out I'm wrong and I miscounted, I could be charged with filing a false report and disturbing the peace. There's a strange potion bottle here. It looks so weird. Let's take it. Let's say one of these was the weapon used in the assault. Which one do you think it is? <laughs> if so, there's no way his head oh. would still be in such good shape. He'd have a big dent in the back. And if the guard is to be believed, he had the spear in his possession right up until that oh, guy shouted about the dragon. Let's say one of these was the weapon used in the assault. Which one do you think it is? If it was the pickaxe, Cafe sure is lucky it's not still lodged in his head. Actually, you're wrong there, Paimon. The foreman at the mine was just saying, this kind of pickaxe is designed not to damage titanium, so it couldn't cause any superficial damage to residents here. But you could probably knock someone out if you hit them hard enough, mm. and it wouldn't leave a scratch. Let's take this back to the crime scene and replay it one more time. Ah, oh, you're back. How was the toilet at Cape's house? Toilet? What about it? Oh, oh, yeah, um, forget that. Show the pickaxe. What's this about? What are you trying to say? We thought the way Cape fell looked odd, so we searched the area for suspicious items and found this. It could have been deliberately placed out of range of the crime scene so it wouldn't show up when we replayed it. Now we've retrieved it, we were gonna replay it again. You don't mind, do you? Oh, uh, I, I just remembered I forgot to turn off the clockwork switch in my kitchen. Yeah, I think I'll just, uh... Oh no, you stay right there! Mm -hmm. uh... Knew it. We 
should be good now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He had the pickaxe. Bruh. Oh lord, he coming. Damn, <laughs> what the fuck? Right? He took so long, Alakina was sitting down. So, it was you! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would congratulate you for cracking the case, but since I did such an abysmal job of covering my tracks, didn't exactly have your work cut out for you. So, all I can say is. Is. Catch me if you can! Oh my god. We have a runner! That's it! Let me at him! The would-be Marquis of Carabas dispatched the Necromater in boots who ran off in pursuit of the poor little minion. Minion's poor little lower back was protesting painfully against the intense physical activity. He decided to take the elevator, giving him a <laughs> moment to catch his breath. Really? His lower back asked. But the minion had no other choice. He resolved to make the jump down. By this point, the Necromata in boots was gasping for air. The minion was huffing and puffing even more loudly. But uh, we'll ignore that. I'm not! Don't underestimate the gold level courier of the Comania Express! <laughs> A characteristically catty response from the Necromata. Tell me, what do you hope to gain from bullying me? <laughs> I get to let off some steam! Oh my god. Haha! <laughs> you fell into my trap! Oh, and uh, by the way, remember the uh, glue you got stuck on when you first entered the future Marquis about to be? That was also me. I did it using my powers. Damn, what the fuck? Rats! Oh, I'm so jealous of you guys right now. You can just jump out of your shoes and keep running, but I... Wait, I'm wearing boots this time. Yes! <laughs> the unnamed minion made a last-ditch escape attempt. He began his long, cruel, long, long crime, climb, sorry, <laughs> up the wall. The, the tall, oh. the tall wall. He began his long climb up the tall wall. Do you call that a tall? <laughs> the unnamed minion made a last ditch escape attempt. He began his long, cruel, long, long crime, climb. <laughs> sorry, up the wall. The, the tall, the tall wall. He began his long climb up the tall wall. Do you call <laughs> that a tall? Oh, <sighs> I'm beat. I surrender. <laughs> it's one way to You've start. got nowhere left to run. All right. I confess. That was fast. Getting caught by you here was a backup plan. I don't know if what I've done will make things better or not. Time to come clean. <sighs> yeah. I am the narrator. I predicted. The one who's been guiding you all this time. 
Gasp, shock, my mind is blown. You're overdoing it a little bit there. Anyway, I only did what I did because... Why are you suddenly spilling the beans? <laughs> I poured my heart and soul into all this. I was worried you wouldn't ask. <laughs> the truth is, I was one of the first conscious beings ever made by the goddess of creation. And I've known for a long time that this whole world is just a fairy tale written by the goddess of fate. I know they say that fairy tales are just made up for kids to read, but I refuse to believe that fairy tales are just fictional stories and nothing more. The reason why Constellation Metropole has three origin stories is that the oh, goddess of fate wrote three okay. drafts and couldn't decide which one she liked best. Then her cat trod all over them and they all got crumpled together, <laughs> so the three worlds just sort of folded into one. The goddess of fate was torn between them anyway, since she couldn't decide which ending was best for the dragon or the kids. So when she saw what the cat had done, she simply decided to go with all three. <laughs> Who would have thought? But what does any of this have to do with what you did? You're not a fictional character, so you couldn't hope to understand my sorrow. Honestly, I don't think there's anyone in all of Simulanka who would understand. Every day that I experience, every interaction I have with another person, is it really all just a work of fiction? The only reason the three great clans wanted to find out the truth was for the pointless task of electing the Supreme Clan. I thought that once they'd learned the truth, it might make them curious <laughs> enough to investigate further. But as it turned out, they just accepted it and carried on living the same old lives. I have to motivate them to keep looking for answers now that they think they've learned the truth. I have to make them uncomfortable with the superficial explanation. I mean, you don't have to. They, they took could just face be value. happy. And I have to figure out, once and for all, while you real people from the outside world are still here, are we real? I think Aww. so. That's my full confession. Time for you to take me back. I'm guessing I'll probably be forced to make a public apology, then sentenced to half a day in solitary half confinement. I definitely deserve half a day. Also, pass this message on to Cape Boberano and Albizzi, if you could. The Great Clockwork Key was originally put in place jointly by the ancestors of the three clans. If the three of them had any ability to cooperate whatsoever, they'd have been able to remove <laughs> it by themselves. Over all these years, not once have they ever tried removing it together. Oh, my poor child. There's one thing you've been mistaken about this whole time. Detective? Was that you? Your voice acting's actually pretty good. <laughs> the reason fairy tales are suitable for children is that they help them to understand the world. Fairy tales may be works of fiction, but at their heart lies an internal logic that is undoubtedly real-world truth in a condensed form. Perhaps they simplify good and evil. And perhaps they hide the darkness in metaphors. But let there be no doubt. The world within fairy tales is as real as can be. And by extension, you and your compatriots are also real. Goddess! Is it really you? The line that separates footnotes from narrative can never be crossed. Never the two shall meet. This is why you have never heard my voice before. But now you wish to break free from the story. And there's a cat nearby, so you can <laughs> hear my echo. Echo Lotta! <laughs> Just... your echo? Detective. Bless him. So, we are a part of the real world too. You lead the surrender detective back to Cafe. So, we need a shot of the crime scene for evidence, a mugshot of the suspect for the records, and a photo of the heroes for posterity. The guard mauled it over. Three photos is overkill. Let's just get one big group photo of the crime scene. Suspect, try and look more serious. Heroes, more natural, please. Happy smiles. But no smiling from the victim or their friends and family. Thank you. 
No, no, don't get up. Stay on the ground. We need to capture the crime scene as is. Three, two, one, say cheese. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Way to fight so experience of my life. <laughs> my head's spinning. <laughs> Albizzi just gave me a quick rundown of the situation. So you caught the detective? Sorta. We me chased too. him until so he surrendered. Oh, and he asked us to pass on a message. You tell the three of the, about the rest of what happened. And that they could have removed the great clockwork key if they just worked together. Does he really think we didn't try that? Because we did. After six months in that place. Ah, that was my bad. I thought it was a stupid idea at the time, so I didn't really exert myself. I, uh... I also sort of stopped trying after three years. Three years? What are you... <sighs> Never mind. I'm partly to blame as well. On the second attempt, I just hugged the key and pretended like I was pulling as hard as I could. <laughs> uh, you guys are so lazy. My granny's neighbor's pet cat has nothing on you, and it spends all day, every day, okay. sunbathing. Uh, anyway, uh, you said you heard the voice of the goddess of fate at the end? That's amazing. There is a world beyond our own, after all. What would you guys say to taking a trip to the outside world sometime? Otherwise, I got bashed in the back of the head for nothing. <laughs> Depends. Do either of you know how to get there? But yes! I agree, we should go. <laughs> and game. not invite the detective. Just to annoy him. <laughs> but maybe the reason we've never worried about whether we're real or not is that, unlike him, I know. <laughs> we weren't there to witness the creation of this world. We've never had any reason to doubt that we're real. If someone ever convinced me that these delightful dimwits, Cafe and Albizzi weren't delightful real... Delightful dimwits. Oh, I'd be devastated. I need delightful dimwits in chat. <sighs> this isn't voice? Okay. Well, if it isn't the Mar Marquis of Carabas, along with her cat and little fairy. Um, I think we should probably stop this now. Surely it's time that Harley and I drop these rolls. In theory, it should all be over now. But I remember hearing that the point of the ceremony was to help people transition. Good for them. From one mental state to another. To bid farewell to the title of Marquis of Carabas once and for all, you can bring things to a close with a touch of formality. As the Nekomata bids farewell to her boots, Though that through the reflection, it'll be wiser to the nature of the truth. Hmm. Interesting that they bothered to have that. That's a little quest and it wasn't voiced. Weird. Anyway. Welcome to Constellation Metropole, Harley, Miss Paimon. My colleagues have apprised me of your names and deeds, and have confirmed that you were valiant indeed. Were I not in charge of training the guards, I should have liked to spar with you. So you regard yourself then? In sooth, I am. On the orders of our liege, we are to defend Constellation Metropole and keep the peace. My work specifically is to train the guards, that their skills may prove worthy of their duty. So the door behind leads to the training grounds? Keen-eyed indeed. It leads to a domain that we just finished remodeling. Within those grounds, the trainee must swing their blade to a specific rhythm, and the arena's lighting will constantly change throughout the battle. Sounds like some pretty rigorous training. Sounds complicated, more like. Do you have to follow that specific rhythm while fighting as well? This part of the regiment is actually derived from a story titled The Owl Musician. It was popular amongst the guards some time back. Many enjoyed it to the point where they'd forget to take part in training and their daily patrols were delayed. But I had a thought. Since everyone liked it so much, adding elements of the story into our training would make it more enjoyable. It has had a visible effect on training. If nothing else, there have been no further delays in our patrols due to personal reasons. He, <laughs> would the two of you be interested in said training? The challenges within should be a piece of cake for those with such valour as yours. I'd love to give it a try. Such commendable courage. Excellent. Please then, step into the domain. Uh, about the owl musician. Ah, interested in this story as well? Allow me to give you a quick summary then. This story tells of a kingdom locked in battle against strange monsters. Do forgive me for skipping over most of the combat abilities, magical effects, and so on. The first third of the story is all about describing the special abilities of each guard in some detail, which, come to think of it, is probably why it was so popular among the troops. In the second half, the monsters use their last resort, corroding the kingdom using a dark night before attacking through that darkness. The guards were forced back to their final bastion, the palace interior, 
but the world outside was being eroded by the devouring darkness. Even the palace lamps were gradually extinguished. As the final light went out, everyone readied themselves for the final battle, resolving to fight to the end, come what may. Suddenly, the sound of flapping wings soared throughout the palace, and a flight of owls swooped in through a window. They were the friends of the palace musician, and when the monsters invaded, the musician knew that the palace would become a battleground, and so had sent those owls away to the forest, and now they had returned. These warriors, who could see through the darkness, circled throughout the palace, using their hoots to alert the musician to the places where enemies lurked. The musician sat before their organ, a grand instrument that had played during countless balls, and which was powerful enough to send its music through to every last corner of the palace. The palace soldiers lift up their hearts and swords amidst the great swell of the organ, for they now knew where they should swing. The musician played, pausing periodically to hearken to the owl's observations, while the soldiers would form defensive formations during those brief pauses. Thus were the monsters repelled as the warriors used the palace as their fortress, driving them out through the darkness under the guidance of the owls and the musician. At last, peace was restored for the palace, and the music that guided the warriors into battle became widespread. And that's how the story ends. Pretty! Wow, this is cool. They must have gone to so much effort to build this. God damn. The city beneath the starry sky is supremely splendid. The suspended stars sway and the seas are still. Here we have the sounds of clockwork winding up in the morning and at night the blended scent of vegetable oil on wood chips wafts over in waves. Each time I experience these, I feel like our world is so beautiful, so perfect, it's almost like it was lifted right from the pages of a story. Traveller, will you remember what stories transpire beneath the starry sky? I will. <laughs> I hope that when you think of the starry sky, you too will feel that sense of serene bliss. Oh my, what an honour! You must be Harley, in which case, the one by your side must be your companion, Ms. Paimon. Hee <laughs> hee, right in one. That's us! We're that famous, are we? News travels quickly to, from, and through Constellation Metropole. Also, I realized I was being stupid and it's not Metropoli, it is Metropole because it's it's French. <laughs> I thought I was being so smart. No, it's just French. <laughs> I must say that you're right on time. I was just putting the fin finishing touches on this game of mine named Flying Hats. I can't be like the eponymous hatter in the Flying Hatter, who gave everyone a lovely hat, I fear. French isn't real true. But I believe that Flying Hats will bring joy to those who play it. I've also designed three completely different gameplay modes for it. Don't worry, don't worry, the rules aren't too complicated. You'll figure it out after just one game, I guarantee it. I guess we're here now. I'll give it a try. Alrighty righty then, this way please. There are three game modes in Flying Hatter's Trick, which, with each having different scoring rules, with blue reticles marking ta targets that can be attracted. Use the Marvelous Flying Hat to score as many points as you can. Okay. If you'd like to play some Flying Hats, you're more than welcome to. About the Flying Hatter. Interested in this tale, are you? <laughs> I'll go over it with you. It's not too long a tale. Mm, so our tale begins with a masterful hatter. This maker of hats made the very best ones in the world, and each day there would be a stupendous crowd outside his door. Still, he would make each hat properly and beautifully. Some said that he had even once been commissioned by a goddess to make ten beautiful hats of different styles. To thank him for his craftsmanship, she offered to grant him a wish, but the hat maker said that he did not have any unfulfilled wishes. He loved what he did, making hats, and everyone loved the hats he made, and that was enough for him. The goddess acknowledged his noble answer, but also stated that her promise would remain valid. Should he ever be willing to make a wish, she would be ready to grant it immediately. But before the hatter had thought of something he truly wanted fulfilled, soldiers in the employ of a noble suddenly came knocking at his door. Our lord orders you to make him the best hat, a soldier said in an overbearing tone. Sure, I'll have it delivered to him once it's done, but before that I have to- No, from now on you shall only make hats for our lord. The soldier cut him off. The cold light glinted off their blades and spears, and he had no choice but to leap with them. What the fuck? <laughs> At the palace, the noble welcomed him warmly, even throwing him a grand banquet. 
come then, make me the best hat. Should not the most powerful of people have the loveliest of hats? <laughs> the nobleman laughed loudly, but the hat maker could not bring himself to eat a single bite. He knew then that he could never again leave that palace. He had heard of this noble's deeds. He was stingy and loved to plunder. Seizing and hoarding consumed his every waking thought. But he was no heroic thief or great mage, he was simply a hatter, and hats could not help him deceive the guards, nor vault the towering walls. And at that moment, the aggrieved hatter remembered the goddess's promise, and realised that it might be his lifeline, and so he pushed the window open and prayed in silence. Dear goddess, please help me escape from this cage. There are still so many out there waiting for me to make nice hats for them. I want to be free to make hats for everyone, that's my wish. In the instant after he finished his wish, the hat in his hands leaped into the air, suddenly fastening itself to his head. His whole body floated up with that hat and was carried out the window, soaring high over the stunned guards and over the heavily guarded walls. A rain of arrows pursued him, but they were turned aside gently by the wind. The flabbergasted guards could only watch as the hatmaker flew away from the manse. After that, none would again see that hatmaker in the city. His hat shop was demolished by the frustrated aristocrat. But the hatmaker's good neighbours knew that he was still working to make hats for the people. If one wanted to order a hat from him, you had to do so after midnight, writing a request on the bark of a tree using jam, before placing the bark and the payment for the hat on the highest chimney. This is very specific. <laughs> Within a week, a beautiful hat bearing the scent of green grass would appear on your windowsill. And that was how everyone came to call him the Flying Hatter. Huh. Give it a try. Alrighty righty then, this way please. In this mode, flying hats can attract up to one toy figure at once. Continually attract toy figures within the allotted time to build up your combo. The higher your combo, the more points you'll get each time you attract a toy figure. Attracting explosive barrels or failing to attract any toy figures will zero out your combo. Attracting explosive barrels will also deduct points from your score. Um, I don't really understand what I'm doing here. Your combo will also be cleared if the flying hat is unable to accurately attract toy figures or does not attract anything for a long period of time. I don't really understand this. Uh, space? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Jump in the gun. Oh my god. most crazy gameplay but it's fine. In the goodly gathering mode you will have a total of 15 attempts to attract toy figures. Once you use them all up the challenge will end. Each flying hat can only attract up to four toy figures at once and the more identically dressed figures you attract at once the higher the bonus points you will score. If you attract an explosion barrel you will not gain any points no matter how many identically dressed figures you attracted. You will not gain any bonus points will instead lose a certain amount. I find that, like, old people really love to do that. <laughs> um... Okay. Come on, come back into the thing. Come on. 
Oh, I didn't make through that. Fuck. It's the most humbling and upsetting thing, yeah. That's brutal. Okay, I'm gaming. I'm gaming. You think the blue guy's ancestors will low-key gay? Why the blue ones specifically? <laughs> Puzzling identity, every stage will have four rounds in total. When each begins, the clothes of the toy figures will be briefly displayed, for they and the items will be covered by gift boxes. Oh god. After you've attracted all the toy figures in each round, you will gain a certain amount of bonus points. Each extra bonus points for, for each gift gift for each gift box, oh my god, that is present still on the field. If you have not completed the objectives when the timer runs out, you will not gain any bonus points and instead move on to the next round. I don't understand this. Fucking god, bro. Ugh, okay. Run on the line there. Okay. Oh my god, bro. 